It's November the 21st, 1963. In the small coastal village of Thumba in Kerala, people stood on the beach and looked up at the clear skies. On this day, Thumba wasn't just a quaint fishing village, but a place where the who's who of science in India had descended. The humid air was thick with tension when a rocket was rolled out towards a clearing on the beach. <laughs> you heard that right, a rocket! You see, Thumba was chosen for India's first and most prestigious space project. This place was special because of its proximity to the Earth's magnetic equator. Scientists watched nervously as the rocket was being hoisted onto a launcher. Suddenly, there was a malfunction. A man from the loading team waved frantically and screamed, We found a leak in the hydraulic crane! The scientists all ran towards the launch pad to manually shift the rocket back into position and fix the crane. But almost immediately, the remote of the launcher malfunctioned as well. Okay, I'm no rocket scientist, but even I can tell this must have been a nerve-wracking situation. But our scientists were determined. After a few minutes of tinkering, an alarm was sounded, giving an all clear. The team of scientists held their breath and watched. It was time for the final countdown. The man who made this one moment happen looked on, wringing his hands nervously. His reputation and India's ambition to enter the space race depended on this launch. <laughs> no pressure. Welcome to a century of stories brought to you by IDFC First Bank. Always you first. I'm Kunal Vijaykar and this is the story of India's first rocket launch and the man who made it happen, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. Before we get to the rocket, let me first tell you a little bit about Vikram Sarabhai. His industrialist family, the Sarabhais, lived on a 21-acre property in Ahmedabad. On the property was a Montessori school run by Vikram's mother, where he studied as a young boy. The property also had a swimming pool, a stable with horses for every member of the family, exotic creatures and even birds. Safe to say that Vikram grew up as a rich kid. His life was very different from an average kid's experience in pre-independence India. He was given access to books, resources and other comforts which let him think beyond the stars. In a matter of speaking, at an early age he showed an interest in physics and chemistry. So Vikram's parents built him a lab. Vikram was an extremely talented boy. For instance, he built a steam engine that was large enough for a child to sit in with a little help from a carpenter called Khimji by Mistri. The Sarabhais, who were eminent industrialists, were also committed to the Indian independence movement. The biggest names from our independence struggle, like Jawaharlal Nehru and Mahatma Gandhi, had visited their home in Ahmedabad and even stayed there. Interactions with these mighty people influenced Vikram at a very young age and inculcated a love for India. Vikram then went to Cambridge University, which was a pretty big deal in the year 1937. Then, World War II broke out. His education was cut short and he had to return to India. To continue his education, Vikram's parents put him in touch with a well-known physicist and director of IISC. You might have heard his name, C.V. Raman. Ring any bells? Being a good friend of the Sarabhais, Raman agreed and took a young and curious Vikram under his wings. It was C.V. Raman who nudged Vikram towards space research and physics. While working at IISC Bengaluru, Vikram met another great man, Dr. Homi J. Bhavan, who had set up the Cosmic Ray Research Unit at the university. Both these men became big influences in Vikram's career. Vikram Sarabhai was ambitious. He wanted India to have its own space program. He wanted to establish the Indian Space Research Organization or ISRO as we call it. File that factoid into your head and let's get back to the rocket. 
In the 1960s, space research still seemed like a luxury for a developing country. It appeared too expensive, too elite, and many believed unnecessary. Sarabhai faced a lot of pushback. He once famously said, There are some who question the relevance of space activities in a developing nation. To us, there is no ambiguity of purpose. We do not have the fantasy of competing with the economically advanced nations in the exploration of the moon or the planets or manned space flight. Just a few years earlier, in 1957, Russia had achieved an incredible feat. They launched the world's first satellite, the Sputnik 1, into space. It sent a radio signal back for three weeks before its three silver zinc batteries ran out, causing it to fall back into the atmosphere and get destroyed two months later. Using the Sputnik launch as an example, Sarabhai told the Indian government how important it was for India to quickly make progress towards our own satellite. During this period, there was a clamor amongst countries to get a UN sponsorship that would fund space programs. Sarabhai pushed and applied for that on India's behalf. Brazil and Argentina were strong contenders, but India triumphed and won the sponsorship to build a rocket launching facility. There was one problem though. We got money for the launch pad, but there was no money for the actual rocket or for some of that critical equipment in it. At this crucial stage, a guardian angel called Jacques Vlamont turned up. He was a French astrophysicist who had heard of Sarabhai's ambitious plan. When Sarabhai approached Blamont asking for a sodium vapor payload, he said yes. In fact, he personally brought the rocket-based payload all the way from France to India. And just like that, the Indian space program was ready to take off. Five years of meetings, negotiations, consultations, and jugaad, Dr. Sarabhai's efforts finally paid off. Now, all roads led to Thumba. Dr. Sarabhai's team approached the Bishop of Trivandrum, Reverend Peter Bernard Pereira, and sought his help. They wanted to acquire the St. Mary Magdalene Church and the surrounding land to set up the Thumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Station, TERLS facility. The Bishop thought about it and sent them an invitation for Sunday Mass. During the Mass, he said to his parishioners, What Vikram is doing and what I am doing are the same. Both science and spirituality seek the Almighty's blessings for human prosperity in mind and body. Children, can we give them God's abode for a scientific mission? The crowd went silent, deep in thought for a while, followed by a resounding Amen. Sarabhai and his colleagues smiled and thanked the people in the church. It was time to begin the work. The church served as the office of the scientists, while the bishop's house and a cattle shed were used to set up the laboratories. However, Thumba still had issues. There was no canteen, so the scientists had to walk or cycle to the railway station at Trivandrum every day for breakfast and dinner. Despite the hardships, on holidays or weekends, the scientists would find joy in little things like going to the beautiful beaches at Kovalam or catching a Hollywood movie at Sri Kumar Theatre. On this team of scientists was also a young man called Abdul Kalam. Just imagine, a young Kalam sitting on a beach in Kerala, soaking in the sun, looking up at the sky, where he and his colleagues would soon make a rocket appear. Beautiful. And now, it's launch day. The villages of Thumba are graping at the sky. Little kids in their school uniforms and shorts, all excited, without understanding what all the hype was all about. Dr. Homi Bhabha was there, and so was Dr. P.R. Pisharotti, the founder director of the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology. The governor of Kerala, V. V. Giri, also showed up with the district collector, Mahadevan Nayar. And 
last but not the least, the bishop who gave up his home for the space program also stood around watching with bated breath. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. At 6.25 p.m. on November the 21st, 1963, India's first sounding rocket soared upwards and marked the dawn of India's space odyssey. This was the moment India told the world, we might be a developing nation, but we are an incredibly ambitious one. You've been watching A Century of Stories brought to you by IDFC First Bank. Always you first. In the next episode, we look at Dr. Verghese Kurian's role in bringing about the White Revolution. I V M.